So in 1 Samuel chapter 7, uh, what we see here, th the kind of the theme of this chapter, I would say, is repentance, judgment, and deliverance. Maybe it'd be the order of judgment, repentance, and deliverance. Judgment, repentance, and deliverance. And if you remember, up to this point in the story, uh, they've just brought back the ark into Israel. The men there peeked into it, and they were smitten, uh, and, and, then, and a lot of men died. And what we see here, beginning in verse 1, it says, And the men of Kirjath-Jerim came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it unto the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass, while the ark abode in Kirjath-Jerim, that the time was long, for it was 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented for the Lord. So 20 years have gone by in this story. And Israel, you know, they're here lamenting after the Lord. Now remember, they were lamenting after the Lord even after that great chastening that we saw back in 1 Samuel chapter 6. Look back there at verse 19. If you remember when it came into the Beth Shemesh back from the Philistines, when they sent it back with you know, the golden mice and emeralds and the cart with the milch kind, and then they, and they, they brought it back and they set it upon the great stone, they burnt the, the, uh, the offering and, and on the, uh, with the, uh, the cart, they used the wood and they made a sacrifice. Then later it says that the men of Beth Shemesh, they looked inside the ark and God, it says there in verse 19, and he smote the men of Beth Shemesh because they looked into the ark. And he even smote of the people 50,000 and threescore and ten men. And the people lamented because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. And he says a great slaughter because a lot of people died. I mean, 50,000 or 70 people is a lot of people. And in fact, if you would, keep something there. We'll look at something real quick in Numbers chapter 1. 50,070 people, that's more men that were counted in several tribes when they, Israel came out of Egypt. I mean, if, they had, if it had just been one tribe back then, God would have just wiped out a whole tribe right there. For doing what? For just looking inside the ark. It says in Numbers 121, those that were numbered of them, even the tribe of Reuben, were 40,600. 46,500 people. In 20, uh, verse 25, those that were numbered to them, even of the tribe of Gad, were 40 and, uh, 40 and 5,150. 45,650 people. And God just got done wiping out 50,000. And you can just read through this list. I mean, he's wiping out more people than were the tribe of Ephraim in verse 33. It says there that those were numbered of them were 40,500. So 40,500 people. That's a whole tribe. So God, I mean, he's just, and it, you just carry on. I mean, he, several tribes were smaller than the number of people that God just killed when they came out of Egypt. <coughs> so this was a, truly was a very great slaughter. But what's interesting here is that they, in verse uh, Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse, uh, verse 2, it says at the end, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord, despite this great chastening. You know, they didn't just get bitter and angry and just say, well, I'm done with the Lord. I'm going to quit on him. You know, all he ever does is, is, is harm us. You know, they, they took that chastening and they, and they accepted it. They dealt with it. And that's the purpose of God's chastening always in our life. That's his purpose here, is to, is to bring about true repentance. That's what chastening is all about. God wants, he chastens us because he wants us to repent. That's what it says in verse 3. It says, and Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, if you do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and, and Ashtoreth from among you and prepare your hearts and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the land of the Philistines. So yeah, these 20 years, they're lamenting after the Lord, but you know what? They've also got some other gods with them too, don't they? They've also got, you know, the god the Ashtoreth. They've got, you know, we lead, read later, they've got Belial in there, which is, you know, Baal or Beelzebub. That's the devil. It's like, it's literal devil worship. But part of them is still lamenting after the Lord. And God uses this chastening to, 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 to work on their hearts. And, you know, when it finally, when they want to get right, when they finally have been lamenting long enough, it, you know, then now it's time for real action. Now it's, you know, the, 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 the sorrow has set in, but now it's time for some real repentance in their life. You know, and we get accused in this church a lot of times of not understanding repentance. You know, we have a true understanding of what repentance is. You know, the repentance is turning. You know, it's, it's going one direction and then, and then, and then uh, you know, heading in another. And people say, well, you guys don't preach repentance. Yes, we do, but we preach it in context. 
You know, we preach, we apply it correctly. We don't apply it to, to salvation because you don't have to repent of your sins to be saved. Amen. You have to repent of your unbelief and turn to belief. That's a correct use of the word repent in that instance. But that's not to say that say, oh, you don't preach repentance. Well, yes, we do because it's in the Bible. You know, and repentance is for God's children, those that have been saved. That's who repentance is for. You know, we ought to be repenting every day of our life. None of us is perfect. We could always be improving. You know, if we get backslidden, we need to repent. You know, then we do need to turn from our sin and repent if we're going to get right with God. And that's what we see in the story is that real repentance results in real change. You know, the putting away of the strange gods, preparing their hearts, serving Him only. You know, turning from these false gods unto the Lord, the true Lord God. If you would, go over to Proverbs chapter 28. So in this story, real repentance results in one, putting away the strange gods. You know, the forsaking of their sin. That's something we ought to do as Christians. You know, if we have sin in our life, we ought to be forsaking it. And I guarantee you, every single one of us has some sin, or sins, plural, in our life that need to be repented of. And we should always be working at that and improving. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, verse 13, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. Say, I want to prosper in life. I want to do well. I want to be blessed. Well, then don't cover your sins. Don't try to sneak around and sin and think nobody notices. You know, he that covereth his sins, you know, you're not going to get away with sin. The Bible says in, in Numbers chapter 32, be sure your sin will find you out. You know, if we sin, God's going to, you know, either God's going to convict us of our own hearts and we're going to acknowledge it, or it might even get to the point where other people find out about it and confront us with it. So real repentance results, you know, putting away the strange God, the forsaking of the sin. And that was the sin in their life back then in Israel. They had this wickedness that, they, and that, that Samuel's saying, look, if you really return, if you're really coming back to the Lord, then you need to put away these other gods. You need to repent. You need to get the sin out of your life. And that's, you know, if we ever find ourselves in a backslidden slate and we want to get right with God, part of that process is going to mean we're going to have to quit, you know, sinning. You know, if we find ourselves in some bar stool somewhere, sitting there, you know, drowning our sorrows or whatever, and, we've, and we realize, I want to get right with God. Well, you know what you're going to have to do is get up, put your bottle down and go back, you know, get out of the bar and get back in church and sober up. Or whatever sin it is. I mean, you pick the sin. You know, part of that getting right with God is forsaking that sin. Not just trying to cover it up and pretend it's not there. <clears throat> you look there in verse uh, 14. It says, Happy is the man that fareth alway, but he that hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief. You know, it, the happy man, the one that's going to prosper, he fears alway. You know, he's going to get right with God. He's going to stay right with God. He's not covering up sin. He's confessing it. And forsaking it. That's what it says there in the latter verse, latter half of verse 13. Whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Whosoever confesses his sin and forsakes his sin shall have mercy from the Lord. <clears throat> you know, and that's something we need to remi be reminded of. That's part of what this this uh, this message is about tonight is the fact that when people you know when people stop covering their sin and confess their sin, you know they should have mercy. You know, people get out of sorts, you know, in church sometimes. And, you know, we've read 1 Corinthians 5. I did a whole series on it. People get found out to be guilty of certain sins. Not because we're falling around, just, you know, because, again, be sure your sin will find you out. You know, if we think we're getting away with it, and then all of a sudden things are brought to light. The church is made aware of it somehow. You know, somebody tells somebody, hey, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so is involved in this sin. It's on 1 Corinthians 5. You know, drunkenness, fornication, extortion, idolatry, covetousness, all these things. These sins that are listed, you know, you might find yourself, you know, booted out of church. But if that person, you know, gets right with God, confesses their sin and forsakes it, they should have mercy. They shall have mercy. Then they're going to get it from God. God's going to forgive them. And God demands that we forgive also. That we also forgive those people. <clears throat> Whoso confesseth it and forsaketh it, them shall have mercy. <clears throat> so that's part of that process. You know, real repentance results in what? The putting away of the strange gods here in 1 Samuel. It results in the forsaking of the sin. Go over to Psalms 139. Psalms 139. Another part of real repentance, what real repentance results in, 
is not just the putting away of the strange gods, but also preparing your hearts. That's what Samuel said. He said, if you do return of the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange God and a gods and Ashtoreth from among you and prepare your hearts. And what is that? What, we, what we, can we equate that to? Well, I would equate that to getting your attitude right. You know, if you want to return to the Lord, if you want to find mercy, you got to change your attitude sometimes. You have to have the right attitude, especially when it comes to your sin. You know, you say, well, I'm going to get right with God, so I'm going to give up this sin. But boy, I sure do miss it. You know, if that's your attitude, eventually you're going to find yourself right back with that sin again. True. Going, well, now i got to get right with, right with God again. I guess i got to put this sin down again. But boy, I sure do miss it. You know, the problem is your attitude. The problem is your heart. It's not right with God. You haven't prepared your heart. You need to prepare your heart. <clears throat> you know, a lot of people, they, 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 they're, they're trying to walk with the Lord. They're trying to, you know, grow as Christians. But they're like, they're like Israel when they came out of Egypt, right? They're still longing for the leeks and onions of Egypt. They think, still think about all the good things that they, they thought they had back in Egypt. You know, they think, well, the Christian life doesn't offer this and that to me. You know, they're not satisfied with the manna of the Christian life. They want to go back and have the leeks and the onions. And they're so, they desire that so much, they forget about, you know, the slave masters and the hard bondage and having to make the tale of bricks and how hard, how the way of the transgressor is hard. Why would they do that? Because they haven't fixed their heart. You know, they might have, you know, they might have forsaken the sin. They might have confessed it. They might have mercy. But in their heart and in their mind, they're still longing for that. They haven't prepared their hearts. You know, we love this psalm, Psalm 139, verse 19, right? We sing it. Surely thou will slay the wicked. Surely thou will slay the wicked, O God. That's a psalm. It's coming. We'll bring it down here, right? <laughs> Do not I hate them. Do not I hate them. We love that song. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. I hate them with perfect. You probably, a lot of you probably sing that in the shower throughout your day, don't you? <laughs> You're driving down the car. Do not I hate them. Yeah, see? <laughs> I hate them with perfect hatred. Right? We love that. I count them mine enemies. And that's a good psalm. <clears throat> And as much as we love those verses, I wonder if we're willing to sing verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Right? That's a song. Do we sing that one? Try me, O Savior, know my thoughts, I pray. See if they <laughs> right? We know that song. That's a good one. They're both great songs. They both need to be sung. But I wonder how much we're really willing to sing that one. You know, if your heart's not right, if you haven't prepared it, that's probably not a song you want to sing. Mm -hmm. Search my heart and know me. See if there be some wicked way in me. Because though you might even have the sin to put away, you might have confessed it and forsaken it, if your heart isn't prepared, you're still longing after it, you're not going to pray that prayer. You're not going to pray, oh, know my heart, Lord. We need to prepare our hearts. It's one thing to confess and forsake sin. But if you want to get some real distance between that and, 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 and minimize the possibility of going back to sin, you need to prepare your heart and get it right. And let God, and just let God search it. What you really need to do is learn to hate sin. Learn to hate it. You know, instead of missing it and longing after it and thinking about it and how it used to, you know, reminiscing about all the sin we used to enjoy. Because there is pleasure for sin, in sin for a season. For a little bit. So we're not so foolish to say there aren't things to enjoy about sin. You know, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You know, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man. You know, the wages of sin is death. When sin hath conceived, it bringeth forth lust. You know, and when lust hath... Here, I'm messing that one up. But you get what I'm saying, right? We, we lust after sin. We desire sin. But we have to remember all the bad things that come from it. And if we do that, you know what? We'll, we'll learn to hate sin. Pray, pray, God, help me to hate sin. You know, we find ourselves, you know, you know, we go out soul winning, you knock on some door, you get a big whiff of the devil's lettuce, right? You hear there's smoking pot in there. And anybody that's many times smoking pot might go, man, that smells good. Remember when I used to smoke pot? I think I'd, oh, I'd like to try that again. You know, or they might see somebody, you know, cracking open a cold one. 
Like, oh, I remember what, I love the taste of beer. Oh, I remember I used to drink that. It tastes so good. My favorite beer was such and such. They might sell, you know, I'll be perfectly honest. They might w go to work in the morning and see a coworker, you know, with a hot cup of coffee and they first light up that cigarette and the paper burns, you know, it first hits your nose. Mmm. <laughs> it makes me just go, ah, what, maybe, maybe it wouldn't be so bad to get lung cancer, you know? <laughs> but then you get that second whiff after it starts to burn a little bit. And you're like, ugh. Or you get somebody's car that smokes and you're just like, whoa, why did I ever do that? Is that what I smelled like? You know, like they say, you know, smoking won't take you to hell. It'll just make you smell like you've been there. <laughs> <coughs> but uh, what if you prayed, Lord, help me to hate smoking. Help me to hate drinking. Help me to hate these sins that are, that, you know, search me, oh God, and try my heart. See if, know my thoughts. See if there be some wicked way in me. And help me to hate sin. Help me not long. I've, help me to prepare my heart. I want to repent. That's part of repentance. Putting away the sin, putting away the strange gods, Preparing your, your heart, getting your attitude right about sin. And then the other thing I think a lot of people struggle with sometimes is, is the fact that they, they, they think that, you know, getting right with God is just putting away the sin. And it is. That's a big part of it, right? Getting, getting the sin out. And, and then they, but then they have this big void in their life. And we talked about this this morning, you know, whenever there's a void, it's called a vacuum because something else gets sucked into its place. It doesn't just stay empty. Something will take its place. And if you get some sin out of your life, you know, you need to fill that void with something. That's why it said there in 1 Samuel, he said, prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only. You know, that's the next part of that process of repentance when you're getting right with God is to fill the void with, of sin with service. You know, if you get busy serving God, you're not going to have time to get involved in a bunch of sin. You're not going to have time to get caught up with, you know, a bunch of worldly things and sinful friends. You start making godly friends, Christians friends. You start getting involved in church and getting involved in the program, the soul winning, get some, you know, get some other friends and spend time with them. You know, instead of spending time reading whatever or looking at trash or whatever, now we're going to start looking at the book. Now we're going to start reading this and spending our, put our eyeballs on this and read it and get to know it. You know, and, 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 and puts, have some, some kind of a filler in your life to, for that sin. Don't just leave this void there. Because eventually, something will take its place. And it's probably going to be that same sin or some other sin. Or something that's going to, you know, at the very least be not profitable. Now look there in 1 Samuel chapter uh, 7, verse 4. It says, Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Asherah. So they really are repenting. You know, they're long. It's one thing to long after the Lord. But it, like Samuel said, you know, if you really return, if you do return with all your hearts, you know, if you're really going to get right with God, then you know what? Prepare your hearts, put away the strange gods, and serve Him only. And that's what they started to do. They put away Balaam and Ashtoreth and served the Lord only. They listened to the preaching. And Samuel said, Gather all of Israel to Mizpeh, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. <clears throat> and it says, you know, they, they, they did exactly what he said, didn't they? He said, Put away Balaam and Ashtoreth. He said, put away the strange God. They did that. And he says, prepare your hearts. They did that. And then he says, and serve the Lord only. And they did that. You know what? You know what's going to help you in your walk with God? It's listening to the preaching and doing it and applying it to your life. Not just showing up and kind of, well, I'm at church, just putting in my time. How much longer until I get out of here? What do you talk about? Oh, I don't know. You know, listen to the preaching, the preaching of the word of God. Read the word of God for yourself. Listen to it and apply it to your life. <clears throat> and they gathered together to Mispi, it says, and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. So what are they doing? They're getting together, right? They're getting in church. They're dro they drew water. They poured it out before the Lord. You know, real repentance, real, when people are really getting right with God, you know, that should involve us afflicting ourselves. You know, they, they might have walked to Mispi and drew that water and went, Man, that sounds, that, I could really use that. But then they pour it out before the Lord, right? And then they fast that day. They say, I'm not going to eat anything. You know, and they say, we have sinned against the Lord. They're really confessing their sin. They're really coming to terms with the wrong that they have done. And real repentance, you know, should involve us afflicting ourselves. Now, I'm not saying let's turn into Catholics and start, you know, dragging ourselves through broken glass <laughs> and flogging ourselves like they do in the Philippines. You know, I'm not going to ask you like they do what they do over there, like literally go crucify yourself, which they actually do. Well, these Catholics do that. They think it's making them right with God. 
That's not what I'm talking about. But there should be, you know, when we've done wrong and we're trying to get it right, real genuine repentance, you know, which is going to evolve some kind of afflicting. You're going to feel bad. You know, it's one thing to be sorry for getting caught and it's another thing to be sorry for the harm you've actually done to somebody. You know, when you get caught doing wrong and, you, and you've hurt somebody, it's one thing to say, yeah, I'm sorry. Or here's the, how, how about this for, uh, for, uh, for an apology? I'm sorry you're offended. <laughs> I'm, sorry, I, I'm sorry you're offended. I've heard that. What a lame apology. That's not even an apology. That's blame. Well, it's your fault that you're offended, and I'm sorry about that. You know? It's one thing to be sorry for you know, getting caught. It's another thing to actually be sorry for what you've done to somebody, for the harm that you've caused. <coughs> and sometimes you know, that takes a while to settle in with people. Sometimes people have to think about what they've, what they've done and that they have to see the after effects of everything that they've done before it starts to settle in on them and they say, wow, I really did do some damage. I really am sorry for the harm that I've caused. And then it sends there, uh, uh, it continues on in uh, verse 6, it says, uh, we have sinned against the Lord, and it says, and Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpeh. Don't judge. You know, that's the big thing out there. Don't judge me. Well, that's the man of God's job to judge. That's his whole, that's what he's there to do, to judge. I mean, he's literally called a judge. It's saying he judged the children. <laughs> and you know, one thing I've learned, you know, pretty recently is that it's harder than it sounds to just judge people, you know, to, 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 to sit there and go, this person's right, this person's wrong, and then to actually go tell them that. Say, you're wrong. You need to get, you know, judge them and tell them, hey, I'm judging you. I'm telling you you're wrong and you need to get it right. That's not for everybody. You know, and that's not, not everybody can do that. Not everybody's cut out for that. You know, some people, you know, that actually gives, you know, physical pains to. <laughs> I'm sitting here going, what are these abdominal pains I've been having the last three days? And <laughs> Brother Adam's like, dude, it's stress. It's stress. You're stressed out. And I'm thinking, this is probably the most stressful thing. You know, I'm not trying to like boo-hoo up here. But I'm just saying, look, when a man, when you got to judge as a man of God, as somebody who's in that a position, it's not easy to go tell people you're wrong. Get it right. Or get out. You know, <laughs> It's literally a pain in my side. <laughs> literally. You know, it's not for everyone. You know, and a lot of guys, and I just say that because, you know, there's a lot of guys out there, they, they like the idea of being a pastor, you know, or, or, you know, being in that position, and that's great. You know, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire the good work. But they better understand what they're in for. You know, judging the people. And it's not easy because it's people, and people mess up, and they make mistakes, and they do dumb things. And sometimes you have to go to them and say, hey, you did something stupid and you need to make it right. And a lot of times they buck and just say, I'm not going to get it right. You know, you're wrong. And then they just scurry off. <coughs> so it's harder than it sounds. That was kind of an optional point, but in the light of everything, I felt like throwing it in there. <coughs> now, kind of in the next phase of the story, so we see that they're, you know, that they're lamenting after the Lord. It's been 20 years. They're sorry for what they've done. And then Samuel kind of calls them on it and says, oh yeah, if you're really sorry, then do this, this, and this. You know, put away your strange gods and get your attitude right. Prepare your hearts and serve him only. You know, quit serving these false gods. And they do that. And what I want us to notice in the story is that when God's people start to get right with God, the enemy doesn't like it. I mean, the enemy can't stop you from being saved. Once you're saved, you're always saved. You know, he can't get your salvation. But one thing he can do is try to get you backslidden and keep you there. You know, and the devil's got this real good way of once he gets people down, of knowing when he doesn't, you know, he can get people so beat down, he doesn't have to beat them anymore. He can just, well, let's just leave that guy alone for a little while. But when he sees you start to pick yourself back up and start to dust yourself off, he's going to come right back. The enemy doesn't want God's people to get right. And he'll give them all the excuses and all the reasons of why they don't need to get right. Look at verse 7. And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together to Mizpeh, and what were they doing in Mizpeh? They were getting right with God. They were drawing out water and pouring it out. They were fasting. They were confessing their sin. When the Philistines heard that, you know, they, it says the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And the children of Israel heard it. And, and when they heard it, they were afraid. And the children of Israel said, unto, said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto Lord God for us, Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. Now, this time, Israel's got the right reaction. If you remember, uh, you know, when they first lost the ark, back in 1 Samuel 3, I believe, when the ark was taken from them, or 4, it's phase, yeah, I'm losing it, but 
<coughs> when they lost the ark, what was when the Philistines came out, it was because they lost it in battle. Remember that? The Philistines came out to battle them, the same enemy, you know, the same battle. And they're like, hey, let's grab the ark. Let's grab our lucky charm and go out to fight. And God will save us. No prayer, no crying out to the Lord, no confessing their weakness, no confessing the fact that God has to fight for them. This time, after they've been chastened, after it's been 20 years, after they're finally getting their hearts right, now they're starting to have the right reaction when the enemy shows up. And what is that reaction? The children of Israel, they, they, ceased, they said, Cease not to cry unto the Lord God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. You know, they went to the Lord. They didn't just run and try to get their lucky charm out. They, didn't try to, they learned their lesson, so to speak. This time, Israel has the right reaction. And of course, Samuel, you know, he, he, um, he helps them. It says in verse 9, And Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it for a burnt offering holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. So, of course, we can see the symbology here. You know, when, when people are trying to get right with God, what does he use? A suckling lamb. You know, this, just this little tiny lamb, right? It's a, it's a lamb that hasn't even, you know, been able to eat solids yet. It's still a suckling. Now, notice what he didn't say. He didn't tell them to, you know, repeat pairs and, and beat themselves. He didn't tell them, you know, ten Hail Marys and four Our Fathers and God's going to save you. No, he offers up the, the lamb. That's what makes intercession for us, folks, is the blood of the lamb. Amen. Not our own prayers, not our own good works, not some other intercessor. It's when the blood of, of the lamb is offered. Amen. And what I love about that picture is that it's a suckling lamb. You know, it's, it's just this one sacrifice. The Bible says that Christ, you know, hath died once for all for sin. You know, he entered, in the, he entered the holy place one time. You only had to do it once. One sacrifice, and it's just this one small sacrifice, but it's good enough for everybody. You know, and it wasn't every guy had to have a suckling lamb. One lamb did it all. You know, there's only one way into that holy place, and that's through Christ. There's only, you know, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And it was good enough for everybody. For God so loved the whole world, loved the world that he gave his own only son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, right? And it's good enough for everybody because it is innocent. Of course, that lamb, you know, is symbolic of Christ. What it, I mean, that's just all throughout the scriptures. In, in John 1, you know, John the Baptist, looking upon Jesus as he walked, said, saith, Behold the Lamb of God. 1 Peter 1, For as much as you know that I were deemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. 1 John 1, 7, If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. The Bible says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Look, it's the blood of Christ that makes us right with God. Because he's that lamb, and that's the picture that we see here. That when God's people you know, are trying, of course we could apply that to salvation, but it even goes beyond that. You know, when you want to get right with God, you're still going to go through the Lamb. You're going to still go through Christ and plead the blood. Not to get saved again, but just to have, you know, to have that clean slate with God, to have that fellowship restored. <clears throat> well, you know, when someone, and, and here's what I want to say about this, is that when someone gets it right, you know, let it go. Don't undermine the blood. Look, if God has forgiven somebody, we sure better too. You won't say, well, I'm glad God forgave you. I'm, I'm sure I'm glad the blood of, the, of Christ has forgiven you, but I'm not going to let it go. That's not good. Don't undermine the blood of the lamb. <clears throat> and what we also see here is that, it, you know, it's the lamb that makes everybody right, and it's the lamb that delivers them. You know, that's where that deliverance from the enemy came from, was when he offered up that lamb. And what I want to make the point is that the enemy cannot stand against the lamb. And we know how the story ends, you know, in, in Revelation, in five, chapter 5, verse 12, you see the multitude saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature was in, which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and as such are in the sea and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne 
and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Look, nobody can stand against the Lamb. Amen. The Lamb of God is going to set up that throne and the enemy will not stand. And that's what happens in our story. Once the, the suckling Lamb is offered, once that atonement is made, once that intercession is made, they're getting their hearts right. And they're using that Lamb. Look at verse 10. And it says, And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near, uh, near to battle against Israel, but the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them, and they were smitten before Israel. They couldn't stand against the Lamb. And I love that phrase he uses there. The Lord thundered, but it wasn't just any thunder. He, he thundered with a great thunder. Now, what exactly that means, I don't know. Was it like lightning and thunder? Did he make their footsteps sound louder? Whatever, I don't know, but... Whatever it was, it was enough to send the Philistines running and to, to make them you know, be discomfited and smitten. And it says in verse 11, And the men of Israel went out uh, of, at Mizpe and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came to Bethkar. Then Samuel took a stone and set it in between Mizpe and Shen and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. And of course, you know, that's a very, we sing that song, Here I raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come. And I hope by thy good pleasure, safely I'll arrive at home. I don't know what song it is, but I remember the lyric. Come thou fount. Yeah, I think that's it. But it's a great picture, you know, in, 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 in of, of God helping. You know, and there's going to be, you know, here's the thing. In, in your Christian life and in the life of this church, there's going to be times where we set up a stone. And when is that time going to come? You know, where there's going to come a time where we set up a stone and say, Hitherto the Lord hath helped me. You know, we made it this far. God's been our help and seen us to this. And when has that moment come after a battle? After there's been an attack, after there's been an enemy that's been defeated. But you don't get to, you don't get to set up that stone and say that. You don't get to put up the Ebenezer and, then, and, and say, hitherto the Lord hath helped me, if God hasn't helped you. And you don't get God to help you if you don't need His help. And look, you're going to face opposition in your life. You're going to face opposition in your Christian life. This church is going to face opposition. Now, I remember years ago, a couple years back, we went through that thing with Baker and his whole oneness debacle. You know, I thought, that was bad. That was a lot of fallout. Like, I thought, this is, it was a battle. But I thought, surely this is it. Surely this, you know, and then before that, there was, you know, the protests at Faithful Word. There, in between those two things, there was a huge protest in Sacramento at Verity Baptist Church with the Sodomites. I mean, we didn't go through that, but we, we could sympathize with our friends that were. I'd say that was probably harder than anything we've, we've gone through as a church, but you know, what I'm, the point is I'm trying to make here is I thought, oh, that, that's got to be it. Surely from here, it's, it's, it's smooth sailing. And then this last week happened. And people are falling away. People are just throwing stuff out there, making all kinds of accusations. And, I, and it's another battle. You know what? I'm not going to be so foolish this time as to say, surely this is it. You know? and, and the thing is, when things like this happen, for some people, it's the first time they ever go through something like this. You know, and they have to learn, and, and it's, it's a learning experience for them. But you know, whatever, what always happens is when you get through it, you know, yeah, you lose some people, but the people that remain are battle-hardened. They're ready for the next one. The next one's not going to be so hard. The next one's not going to be as difficult. And every time you go through one of those battles, you know what you get to do at the end? You know what you could do on the other side of the battle after, after God thunders upon the enemies with the great thunder? You get to set up a stone and say, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. And that's, you know, that's where we're at now. Because we've gotten through it. You know, we still have our pastor. Sorry to all those haters out there. He's still there. Deal with it. Move on with your life. And we're going to go right on with ours. But we're going to be able to say, Hitherto the Lord hath helped us. Amen. I don't know that they can say that. I don't know what stone they're going to set up and what they're going to call it. But, you know, we're going to be setting up our own Ebenezer and saying God has helped us thus far. Because he has. <laughs> that wasn't in my notes, but uh, there you go. Now, when we repent, the next thing I want to show, because we're talking about, you know, repentance, judgment, deliverance, right? We saw the process, you know, real repentance results in, you know, people getting their attitudes right, forsaking their sin and serving God. And when we do that, then we know that God's on our side. You know, when we, when we go through the blood, when we confess our sins, you know, to, to, oh, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we go through that process as God's people, He's there to deliver us from the enemies. The enemies who don't want us getting right or doing right. 
You know, but when we repent, when we get right with God, God protects us. Look, if you're right with God, I don't care what happens. I don't care. What, and it's easy to, I know it's easy to say that, but it's the truth. And people say, yeah, I believe that. But then they actually are put in a position where they actually have to walk by faith, where they actually have to rely on God. And then you, you know, the people that start freaking out, mark it down. They're the ones that aren't right with God. There's something wrong with their walk with God. They don't have the faith they need. There's some sin in their life. I don't know what it is. But the people that are resting in the Lord, that are trusting in God, it doesn't matter what happens because they know God will protect us. That God is going to keep us as the apple of his eye, that we're in the hollow of his hand. You know, that's not, that's not just you know, flowery talk. That's a reality for some people. Not every, not every, and just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you automatically get that. It's the people that go through this process of repenting, sacrificing, serving. They're the ones that when the Philistines come, they can just, you know, they can keep right on with the sacrifice right up to the Philistines or right in their face, just knowing, well, God's going to thunder on them. Let's just keep serving God, and I don't care how close they get. God's going to thunder on them, and he'll protect us. And when it's all said and done, we're going to praise God for it. When we repent, when we get right, we're assured of God's protection. The Bible says, in Proverbs 16, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. He make even his enemies to be at peace with him. You know, when, you, when, you, when you're right with God, you know, if God be for us, who can be against us? <clears throat> and, you know, there's always be a battle. And if you want to be assured that you're going to come out on the other side praising God, then you know what? You need to make sure that you're right with God. And you've got to make sure your ways please the Lord. Oh, there's a lot of enemies. Oh, I'm afraid of what's going on. I want to be protected from God. Well, do your ways please the Lord? Then stop worrying about it. But when people are worried, when they're getting tossed to and fro, and they're freaking about, about this and losing their mind about that, and there's a lot to lose your mind out about <laughs> these days. Coronavirus, riots, this and that. And I'm not saying, you know, just because you're taking precaution that you're losing your mind. You know, God, you know, obviously gives us wisdom and enough to use common sense when it comes to these things. <clears throat> but those people that are just, you know, this is it. This is the end of the world. Everything's going down the drain right now. I, I just sit back and I go, do your ways please the Lord? Because if your ways please the Lord, you'd know even your enemies will be at peace with you. That, that, no, that no harm is going to come to God's people. <clears throat> and look, there's always going to be a, ballot, a battle. You know, the Philistines are always going to show up. They showed up here at Ms. P. You know, they're going to come to church. That's where they're going to pick their fight is in church. They're not going to wait for you to come to them. They're going to come find you where you are, and that's where they're going to pick their fight. And that's what we saw there. They said, oh, they're at Ms. P. Doing what? Having church. Pouring out an offering unto the Lord. Making a sacrifice. You know, that's, and that's where they said, well, let's go fight them over there. there there's going to be a battle, there's, and they're all going to take place right in here. In this church. And just mark it down. There'll be another one. And if you want to get through that one with some peace of mind and not have to worry about it, just between now and then, make sure your ways please the Lord. And you'll be all right. The Bible says in Psalm 23, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. You know, he's preparing a table. He's, not, he's just sitting down to dinner right in the battlefield. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. When they're right there, they want to destroy, they want to hurt, they want to maim, they want to cause harm to the body. And God says, sit down and eat. I got this. And he, anou he anointeth my ho uh, head with oil. My cup runneth over. You know, I'm, I'm, I, you know, we still have joy. I mean, people go through things, they get in these fights, they get in these battles, and they just completely lose their joy. <clears throat> and that shouldn't be the case. You know, we should be at peace, even in these tough times when, when things happen. So when we see, you know, when, when people repent, there's this process that takes place. And, you know, and then when they go through that process, you know, God delivers them. And God protects them. And God sees them through these, these battles when they're right with God. And not only that, but when we repent, you know, God restores us. You know, we, God gives us back the things maybe even that we lost. Now, I will say, you know, sin will always have its consequences. And there might be things that happen because of sin that you can never change. But a lot of times, you know, maybe God even gives, you know, we get right with God, we, we repent, we, you know, we, we, we start to serve God, all of that. And then God, you know, he restores those things to us, those things that we've fallen away from. Look here in verse 13, it says, So the Philistines were subdued, and they came no more into the coast of Israel. 
And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. And the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were what? Restored to Israel from Ekron even to Gath. And the coast therefore did Israel deliver out of the hands of the Philistines. So not only did God protect them, not only did God see them through that battle, but then he actually adds to them and, and restores these former cities to them. And they get back what was taken from them. That's real victory. You know, we, we go through some struggle, we go through, you know, we get some sin out of our life, you know, and then God actually helps us, you know, become better Christians. We, we, we gain ground, spiritually speaking. <coughs> so, let's just continue on in the story. It says, uh, it says there, and there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Again, you know, in the presence of mine enemies. <laughs> He's making a table. And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life, and he went from year to year at circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpeh, and judged Israel in those place in all those places, and his return to Ramah, for there was his house, and there he judged Israel, and he and there he built an altar unto the Lord. So what was the sermon about tonight? You know, it was about repentance, it was about, you know, deliverance, it was about judgment. You know, the fact that, you know, we need to get right with God, because if we don't, God will judge us for it. Israel, you know, was 20 years lamenting after God, but that was after they lost 50,000 plus guys, you know, after God had been chasing them and judging them. And when they finally decided they really wanted to get right with God, they had to do some things. It wasn't just, oh, I'm sorry. It was like, oh, if you're really sorry, then show me. If you're really sorry, then let's, let's see some change here. Let's see you, you know, uh, you know, get the sin out. Let's see you put away your strange gods. Let's see you change your attitude, you know, and, and, and get your heart right. You know, prepare your hearts. You're really sorry? Well, then let's see you serve God. You know, let's see you add, you know, fill that void of sin in your life and make that change permanent. Not just sit there and spend your time lamenting after the leeks and onions of Egypt, but actually get right. And we saw, you know, as a result, you know, God protects us. If that's what you want today, you know, then you got to be right with God. And then when we repent, God's restore us. But you know what's better? You know, that's great. That's great news, isn't it? That there's always a way back with God. That there's you know, always a way to get right with God. That it's never too late to just, you know, I mean, I'm not saying there aren't consequences. You know, 50, those 50,000 guys were still dead. You know, that, that, that whole story still happened. That's just a matter of fact. That's part of history now. But isn't it great that they still were able to go back and even get, have those lands restored unto them to get that ground back and to have that protection? That's a great story. It's a nice ending. You know what's better than that is not having to repent at all. It would have been a better story is if when the Philistines came out the first time, they did what they did in this story and cried unto the Lord and said, protect us. Instead of just walking out there, well, I'm, a, I'm just right with God all the time, no matter what, God's going to protect me. And then the ark's gone and this whole story happens. The better story would have been that they just never had to repent at all, that they were just stayed right with God the whole time. You know, and maybe we've gone through a, a season in our life where it's, you know, we've had to repent already and get right with God. Let's just not live that story again. You know, that once was enough for that. You know, hey, I, I, I you know, was backslidden. I was in sin, whatever, but I repented and I got right. Let's not make this a cycle for ourselves where we're constantly losing ground. The battle is, you know, that we're losing battles, enemies defeating us. And then we're dragging ourselves back into the fight. You know, we're getting right with God. We're going back through this process. You know, God's restoring us, forgiving us. And then we just fall back again. And then we, and it's just a cycle. We don't want that. And it's better to never have to repent at all. As good as, it, as God's grace is and all that, it's better just to never, and I understand nobody's going to be perfect. We're all going to have to call upon God's grace at some point for things. But let's not, you know, these major life-changing events that people go through. Right. You know, it's better to just, you know, once is enough and, and none at all is even better. So the message, you know, the, the application tonight is this, is that, if you're right with God tonight, keep it that way. Because it's better to not have to repent at all. To just get right with God and just stay that way. Let's go ahead and pray.